Great. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Adam Law, and I'll be the session chair for the next little while. Um, and the title of this session is entitled The Law Related to Airway Management Incidents. Now, I want to assure you that my last name is a pure coincidence. Um, we have three well-qualified speakers today for this one-hour session. There'll be 15-minute talks, hopefully leaving a little bit of time at the end for some questions. Um, so please leave your questions until the end. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the morning because we're already a few minutes into the hour. Uh, Dr. Marianne Balkan visits us from Melbourne, Australia, where she's a specialist anesthetist in public practice at Alfred Health. Dr. Balkan has a subspecialty focus on ear, nose, and throat and airway-related anesthetic practice and is department airway lead. She's a member of the ANSCA Airway Special Interest Group Executive. And uh, most importantly, she recently completed a Juris Doctorate degree in law at Monash University in 2021 and continues her law education by currently undertaking a Health Law Master's at Melbourne University. So I think you're, uh, you'll agree that we're very fortunate to have a very well-qualified speaker to address us this morning on the law and airway management. Dr. Balkan. Thanks very much for that introduction and thank you to the organising committee for the invitation. So, my single disclosure is that although I have a legal qualification, I've never worked as a lawyer, so nothing that I say in this talk should be construed as legal advice. I'm just hoping to put a legal lens on some common scenarios that arise. So this, this presentation refers to law in the common law world. And these are countries who have legal systems originally derived from the King's Court in England and now is a legacy of British colonisation. The system is largely similar in the USA, presumably because of early British influence. And currently, about a third of the world's population resides in common law jurisdictions. The common law refers to judge-made law or precedent, and this is in contrast to the role of statute, which is law made by legislators. But in all jurisdictions, this is taking a, an ever-important role. So the common law world has an adversarial system, and in the medico-legal sphere, that means that a claim is made against a doctor and then it is either settled or defended. And this contrasts to the inquisitorial systems in many European countries and their legal systems originate from Roman law. So why does this matter? We go to work each day with the main aim of first causing no harm. And if we're involved in litigation... This means that not only has harm occurred, but somebody is alleging that it is actually our fault. And this is very professionally confronting. The nature of anaesthetic medico-legal claims are quite unique in that they are rare, but they often involve severe harm and they're very costly. And to some extent, they're unpredictable. They commonly arise from a failure to manage fairly straightforward clinical circumstances. And this means that as an audience interested in airway management, we all realise that we're potentially one case away from airway catastrophe. Most medico-legal cases are centred around the tort of negligence. Not all harm is preventable. And the fault element that's prosecuted in negligence is one of carelessness. So what the legal decision makers are trying to make up their mind about is the management of a foreseeable risk. The duty of care element in medico-legal cases is usually uncontroversial and most of the legal argument will reside around setting a standard of care and then trying to determine whether this standard of care was breached. The causation element means that it needs to be established that there is a relationship between the harm that has been observed and the breach of care that occurred and injury or harm is fairly self-explanatory. So I'm going to talk about diagnosis and treatment and consent separately and that's because the law that's applied to these two categories of claims is different. So the standard of care for diagnosis and treatment um, really arose in a 1957 English case called Bolan. 
and please excuse the gendered language um, that articulates the principle of this case, a doctor is not negligent if he is acting in accordance with a practice accepted as proper by a responsible body of medical men skilled in that particular art. This principle really um, has been utilised in most parts of the common law world. In North America, it's often referred to as customary practice. And in my home country, Australia, we have legislation that has codified this principle for diagnosis and treatment, and we often call it the peer professional standard. This means that the influence of expert witnesses in medico-legal cases is highly influential. And although that can sometimes be a good thing, it also opens up these claims to the issues around hindsight bias and partisanship, particularly because many of these expert witnesses can be paid. And as you will not all know, if you ask uh, around your colleagues about how to manage a particular airway scenario, you're going to get a lot of different opinions. So rarely we'll see a, a report which is um, sensationalist, uh, but most medico legal claims are not nearly this clear cut. This was a, a tragic um, report that came out a few years ago of a very inebriated anaesthetist who performed an esophageal intubation during a caesarean section and the patient died. But these cases are rare. One of the things that's really difficult about this area is that in common law jurisdictions, over 95% of the cases are settled before they come to court. And that means that these are on confidential terms. It's really difficult to get accurate data um, about medico-legal cases. So we're fortunate that in the last few years we've had publications, the closed claims from the US, um, an equivalent uh, publication from Canada, and uh, also a report from the NHS. It's uh, even more difficult to get this information in my home country. And so what we can see when we look at these publications is that there's some universal deficiencies in airway claims the first category is a failure of planning and to prevent airway loss. And this can involve an inadequate or absent preoperative assessment. The second part is a failure to incorporate the risks that were discovered in the preoperative assessment into the airway plan. And then there is a constant risk of um, failure to manage aspiration. So the second category of claims falls into a failure to rescue after airway loss. And we all know about the increasing emphasis on human factors and simulation and cognitive aids to try to remedy this deficiency. And there's also a failure of, you know, often related to situational awareness to use our oxygenation lifeline. And there's the ever-present risk, um, the tragic diagnose, misdiagnosis of unrecognised esophageal intubation. And so just to illustrate um, some of these deficiency, how, how they might arise in a medico-legal case, I'm going to briefly go through three vignettes. They're all taken from real cases and we're going to imagine what the opposing legal counsel might ask in, if they, this case was to come to trial. So the first one is an adult patient with an acute neck hematoma post C-spine surgery. There was a rapid sequence induction undertaken prior to the surgeon being present um, and this was followed by a failed intubation, a CRCO, a cardiac arrest, then delayed front of neck. The tragic outcome was death due to anoxic brain damage. So we can see despite the risk factors in this case, the, the practitioner decided to just undertake routine care. So the plaintiff's counsel here would probably ask a few questions about this. One of them might be, doctor, given this was a high-risk airway, did you consider securing the airway with the patient awake? And doctor, please describe how your airway plan recognised the obvious risk factors and prepared your team for potential airway loss. So the difficult airway algorithms we have access to, whether that be the DAS, the Canadian Airway Focus Group guidelines or the American guidelines, they're not, they don't, um, they're not a legal standard as such, 
but they're very likely to be utilised by an expert witness to infer a standard of care that should have been followed. The second case is a surprisingly common one. This is from the state of New South Wales in Australia. An elderly man scheduled for gastroscopy and stent insertion had a known history of esophageal adenocarcinoma. Unfortunately, he had a massive regurgitation after the sedation was commenced and the outcome was death in recovery. We know from all of these publications, looking at negligence cases, that aspiration, although it's rare, the results can be catastrophic. So the plaintiff's counsel here is likely to ask, Doctor, given this patient presented at high risk of aspiration, what precautions did you take to mitigate the risk of this eventuality? And you know, the uh, excellent anaesthesi an anaesthesiology publication that I have on this slide um, indicates that about 60% of the time in massive aspiration, risk factors were present. And although, as a profession, we have not yet got a consensus of how to best manage aspiration risk, what we can safely say is if it occurs in the presence of risk factors and in absence of precautions, the outcome's likely to flavour the plaintiff. So the final case is a Victorian case. It's a middle-aged man with salivary gland abscess. He was intubated with difficulty. Extubation then failed. This was followed by airway loss. Delayed front of neck access because of conflict between the anaesthetist and the surgeon about whose role it was to access the neck and then some uncertainty about how to provide oxygenation with jet ventilation. The outcome here was death due to hypoxic brain damage. So we know that there is an increasing emphasis on extubation planning and that is because it has been long neglected and rarely formalised. The plaintiff's counsel in this case is likely to ask, Doctor, given this patient proved difficult to intubate, how did you modify your approach to ensure safe extubation? They might also ask, after airway loss had occurred, how did your attempts at airway rescue prioritise oxygenation? And finally, Doctor, please describe your prior practical experience with the oxygenation rescue technique you employed. It's, you know going to be difficult to defend this case with these facts present. So then there are some claims um, which we know under the uh, legal Latin term res ipsa locator, which means essentially the thing speaks for itself or the case speaks for itself. And, and the claims that fall into this category is a failure in documentation. And for instance, we know from the NAP studies and subsequent studies that if you have or have not performed an airway assessment but you haven't documented it, you may as well have not done it because there's going to be no way of proving it. Um, and again, the ever-present risk of unrecognisable, uh, unrecognised esophageal intubation. Um, it now, thankfully, we have the PUMA guidelines which really set the standard for this now. So just moving quickly on to consent. Um, <coughs> So I've talked about how in the diagnosis and treatment realm, it really is the experts determining the standard of care. But in consent, it has a patient-centred standard has been endorsed. This trend has occurred over many decades. So it started in the 70s with a US case called Canterbury and Spence, um, followed shortly thereafter in Canada with Rebel and Hughes, and then in the early 90s, there was a landmark Australian case called Rogers and Whitaker. And in this case, the court clearly stated that it is up to the court and the court alone to adjudicate the standard of care for informed consent. So we can see that in most of the common law world, there was a rejection of the BOLAM or peer professional standard for consent. It was very interesting that the UK held strong to the Bolan principle for consent up until 2015. And then a very well-known case of Montgomery and Lanarkshire was decided. Nadine Montgomery was a small statured woman um, who had a macrosomic baby. But at no point in her pregnancy was she warned about the risk of an obstructed labour. She wasn't told about the risk of shoulder dystocia. 
nor was the option of a caesarean section ever provided to her. So the English court ultimately, after several appeals, um, gave their decision, which was that the exchange that occurs between the doctor and the patient must be based on a subjective assessment of what the patient would want to know. It's not going to be enough for the doctor to tell the patient what they would like to talk about. So this requires a multi-stage dynamic process, which includes information about the treatment, the potential benefits, the risks, alternative treatments and their attendant risks and the consequences of no treatment. Of note, the uh, claims for informed consent in the UK have increased since 2005. So how, do, how should this impact our consent for airway management? Airway management is relatively unique and highly technical and it would be inappropriate for us to overwhelm patients with many of the details that we um, need to be across before we manage an airway. However, if the patient has a high-risk airway, we should be providing more information to them. And if we are planning non-routine airway management, we should also be giving them more information. I think as a specialty, we're very good at providing um, information about the risk of dental damage, but we might commonly forget that there's about a 1% risk of vocal cord injury with intubation, and this can result in temporary or permanent voice changes. And you can imagine that would be a material risk for somebody who relies on their voice for work, whether they be an opera singer or a radio announcer. So we should mention it in those situations. And finally, we need to think about alternatives to airway management. In some cases, the most appropriate airway management is going to be a plan that obviates the need for airway management. And the case that springs to mind for this is the well-known case of Gordon Ewing, who was a man who came in for a revision of his little finger and ended up dying when his airway was lost. So, finally, in summary, the law is a really blunt instrument. It's not going to provide ideal risk management. But what we can use the law and medical legal cases for is understanding that medical risk does not equate with clinical risk because a really small percentage of patient harm results in litigation. It does provide useful learning and focuses our attention on risk management. What we really want to do is achieve a safety culture, which is going to involve meticulous and systematic monitoring, review and accountability. The most desirable system would continuously improve safety rather than retrospectively allocating legal blame. And so hopefully this will segue nicely into the next two talks. We should all be considering how we can implement routine collection of outcome data for registries to guide continuous quality improvement. Thanks for your attention. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Balkin, for that excellent presentation. Now, speaking of well-qualified speakers, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tim Cook. So Dr. Cook visits from the uh, United Kingdom, where he's a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care at the Royal United Hospital in Bath. He's honorary professor of anesthesia at the University of Bristol. And as we probably all know, he's director of the UK's National Audit Pro Projects, and uh, has had central involvement in no fewer than five such projects, including the NAP4 project that addressed airway management, and most recently NAP7 addressing perioperative cardiac arrest. I've also had legs broken before. So, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you want to do, uh, go into the next? Yes, I'm going to ask. Yeah, it's my turn now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, my, my, my apology. I've, I've substituted in the wrong talk um, over there, which I will correct now, and I wonder if Yasmin might speak before me, so my apologies. Okay. All right. So we will uh, go on then to our uh, now second speaker, Dr. Yasmin Endlich. Uh, thank you very much for, doc for uh, hopping in, Dr. Endlich. Um, so Dr. Endlich is a consultant anesthetist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital uh, in Australia. She's immediate past president of the ANSCA Airway Management Special Interest Group and is South Australia Airway Lead and is the chair of the Australia New Zealand Web Airs Publication Committee. <clears throat> 
Dr. Endelik has many airway-related interests, including uh, anesthetic incidence reporting and, and evaluation, management of the difficult airway in both adult and pediatric uh, patients, using advanced airway assessment techniques such as ultrasound and nasendoscopy, anesthesia for trauma, maxillofacial procedures, and anesthesia in low-resource settings. And I know she's very involved in the, the low-resource environment. So, obviously, uh, possessing limitless energy and enthusiasm, Dr. Endelik will share some insight on airway incidents from the WebAirs database. Dr. Endelik. Thank you very much. Um, just waiting for my perfect. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and to talk about airway incidents reported to WebAirs. I have got no conflicts of interest to declare, apart from that I've been recently appointed as the new medical director of WebAirs and Amsterdam. Um, which gives me a personal interest to make the database even more successful than what it is already. So what is WebAirs? So WebAirs is the web-based anesthetic incident reporting system which belongs to the Australian and New Zealand Tripartite Anesthetic Data Committee, which is called ANSTADEC. So any anesthetist across Australia and New Zealand who is registered with one of these three organizations can provide de-identified voluntarily and anonymously um, information about any incident that happens in their anesthetic practice. This includes near misses where things didn't go to plan and up to significant harm and death. So WebAirs has been existing since 2009 and since then we've collected more than 11,000 incidents reported to WebAirs from more than 245 different sites. And when we look at how the data is collected, so we've got two different types of data that we collect. So we've got the narrative boxes where the reporter can describe the incident in their own words and basically tell the story about what has happened. And then we have got a number mm -hmm. of drop-down boxes where we collect um, codified data and demographic data as well, which then helps so to categorize the data and it also helps with the analysis to basically stratify and look at it. When we look at how the incidents that are reported to WebAirs and which categories they fall, you will see the big blue long bar at the bottom of the graph, which belongs to area and respiratory events. So a third of all the reports to WebAirs since 2009, so that has been consistent, um, belongs to respiratory and airway events. And if we then look further into it, into the subcategories, we see that the most common reported airway incident is aspiration, um, which is followed by laryngospasm and by difficult intubations. So the aim of WebAirs is not only to collect data, but also to report it back to the anesthetic community so that we all benefit from it and that we all can learn from it as well. So the one analyzer group um, looked at the first 4,000 incidents and it looked at all the incidents where the patient aspirated some sort of different content. So there were 121 patients the majority of them were elderly patients with significant comorbidities. Um, all of them had, or not all of them, but a lot of them had some pathology which delayed the gastric emptying. Um, emergency procedures featured, but so did endoscopies and elective endoscopies um, and also colonoscopies. So when we put on the abdominal pressure to support the scope going around the corners, um, that quite often led to aspiration in some of the events. What we found when, when or what the analyzers found when looking at the data was that harm was significantly more present in this subcategory of airway incidents in comparison to others. So there were eight patient deaths. Um, more than half of them had to go to ICU. Um, more than a third of them required prolonged ventilation. Um, and nearly 20% of them had a prolonged hospital stay as well. Um, the analyzers did not um, describe in the report the immediate and definitive management, um, so that will come when we then look at the next cohort of aspiration. We tend to analyze and use what we call a bow tie diagram, so which is read from left to the right when we analyze incidents that are reported to webinars. All right, the next study, when we looked at the next 4,000, was looking at difficult intubations in the first 4,000 incidents reported to webinars. Um, and what we found was that difficult intubation happened in about two-thirds of them and failed intubation in a third of them. And what was interesting, and maybe that relates to Marianne's talk as well, was the airway assessment. So more than 66% of all the patients had one, at least one predictive factor um, leading to expecting a difficult airway. But nevertheless, nearly half of the reporters did not anticipate a difficult airway. 
Um, a third of them mentioned the Mellon Patty score, a third of them mentioned the previous area history, um, less than a third mentioned neck extension, and only a very small number mentioned um, jaw protrusion. In 24 of the reports, no area assessment was mentioned. That does not mean that it wasn't performed, so the data is assessed voluntarily, but nevertheless, as an anesthetist, when we report an area incident, you would expect some area assessment to be mentioned as well, right? Some mentioned an area assessment, but did not act with the findings. So this is directly taken out of the report. Some were assessed by colleagues as difficult, but the anesthetist on the day did not act on the findings. Some were known difficult areas in the past, and then on reflection, the anesthetist felt they should have prepared better based on this finding. And some were reassured for previous general anesthetics or assessments of others um, and did not act um, based on their own assessment. When the airway assessment failed, so we looked at management of that as well, the initial successful device, what was used and successfully used after the initial attempt failed, and was, was most commonly successful with the face mask ventilation, so very basic airway skills. So it was successful in 42%. When the laryngeal mask was used as a successful or as a rescue device, it was successful in only half of the times when it was used, and then the other half it wasn't. Some events described multiple intubation attempts until they were finally successful, um, and two uh, described a successful front of neck access. Other rescue devices which were used were, for example, the intubating LMA as well, which was attempted in 15 of the reports. Um, oxygenation was successful in 10 of them, but that did not mean that they used it to wake up the patient. Blind intubation, when it was performed, was only successful one single time. And we compared that when using um, a flexible bronchoscope on the supraglossic airway device. Again, it was attempted in 15 patients. Intubation was successful in two-thirds of them, but also failed in a third of them. So we all know that um, areas, also airway events, that they can be catastrophic, and that they can be catastrophic really quick because time is ticking, um, despite now having more different devices available to prolong our apneic oxygenation time. But the beauty of this is that they are rare. So this is a multi-center study across 12 different centers that we performed over six months. This is where we also had the nominator data, and we looked at every single airway event which was reported during this six-month period. And what we found was that there was one incident for every 1,180 anesthetics. So a fairly small number, which is great in clinical practice, which makes research hard because we can't randomize them. They come unexpectedly, as we have seen. Um, so this brings us to the beauty of having a really big database with more than 11,000 events reported, so we can look at rare events there as well. And what we did, because it's big in, a big topic at the moment, is we looked at esophageal intubations in anesthetic practice um, across Australia and New Zealand. So we looked at all the narratives where the word esophagus was mentioned, we screened for them, and then looked if there was an esophageal intubation at any time of the event. We found 109 reports. Um, many mm -hmm. were as part of a difficult airway management, and the outcomes ranged from no harm to significant harm and death. When looking at the narratives and then analyzing them, we had to define esophageal intubation and the recognition in a bit more detail. So the consensus guidelines um, only refer to unrecognized esophageal intubation, which is an intubation, esophageal intubation, which is not promptly recognized. That did not help us with our analysis. So we defined it a little bit further. So we had the immediately or early recognized esophageal intubation. So that is when the reporter mentioned the visualization of the tube going into the esophagus. Um, or when it was recognized due to the lack of entitled capnography. Um, and unrecognized, so the late esophageal intubation was when there was hypoxia or hemodynamic instabilities. When a different team recognized the esophageal intubation, and when the anesthetist moved to the next stage of the anesthetic, which was turning on the ventilators, going into maintenance phase. Two thirds of them um, were early recognized esophageal intubation. One for, uh, and one-fourth of them, one-quarter, um, were delayed recognized esophageal intubation. Not surprisingly, most commonly, the cause of the esophageal intubation was a difficult airway, um, was a compromised laryngeal view, was aspiration of blood in the airway, um, or was a junior performing the intubation. Um, looking and comparing with what was done regarding the PUMA guidelines, so 
Seven did not use entitled CO2. These were cases in neonatology um, and in remote areas like ED and ICU. Um, most of the reporters removed the tube when esophageal intubation was suspected. And what was interesting as well, in nearly a half of them, videolaryngoscopy was used, and despite the use of the videolaryngoscopy, the tube ended up in the esophagus in these reports. Some outcomes. So there were a number of cases of significant cardiovascular collapse um, due to delayed recognition of esophageal intubation. Some of them did not have entitled CO2 monitoring. Some were significantly cognitively loaded events um, with significantly critical irritations. But there were also incidents of significant injury to patients where esophageal intubation was immediately noticed. So there were events where there was an esophageal tear, the patient required surgical repair, were packed bed for months, had prolonged hospital stay, emphysema. Um, and there were some deaths. There were four deaths in this cohort. Um, most of them were critically ill patients. One of them was a sick patient in ICU with prolonged attempts, and it took a while until the esophageal intubation was recognized. And we feel that a patient who is on the edge already and then has still prolonged apnea and hypoxia, that is just what might tip them over the border, and that's it. Um, we also found a little conundrum, so bronchospasm esophageal intubation. So when we looked through the narratives, um, we found 12 reports of bronchospasm, which were misdiagnosed initially as esophageal intubation and then recognized to be bronchospasm. In all 12 of them, the reporters removed the endotracheal tube um, and in some with significant consequences to the patients, including front of neck accesses, ICU admissions, severe prolonged hypoxia as well. So what we're doing at the moment is we're looking at all the incidents where there was lack of entitled CO2 reported in the narrative. So we're screening through them at the moment and see if we can find a list or a deeper insight in, in incidents where there was no entitled CO2 reading despite the tube not being in the esophagus. Um, hopefully the paper will be published soon. It's been accepted, it's been reviewed. We're just waiting for the journal to, to finally um, print it so that we can all read it as well. So my final thoughts, um, the area incidence uh, is low, so we, we don't have many, but they continue to feature as the most commonly reported event in our incident database. Um, aspiration continues to be a concern, so we, we've started looking at the next nearly 8,000 incidents now, and aspiration is still featuring and is still causing significant patient harm. Um, area assessment is still a concern, either we're not doing it or we're not doing it right, or our methods are not good enough. Um, blind techniques are not advised anymore. So in Australia and New Zealand, in the equipment guidelines, we've removed the intubating LMA and removed the um, advice of using the intubating LMA blindly. Um, and the big database is really useful for looking at rare events and events that not happen that that common commonly to get more insight into them. Um, this is our, our web page. So WebS is not only collecting data about area incidents. We also recently published about pediatric regional anesthesia cardiac arrests. So feel free to have read they're all freely available. Um, and I would like to acknowledge um, a few very important people before I finish this talk. So we've got Martin Karwick, who is the immediate past medical director of WebS, who has been basically building up that database over the last 16 years and deserves a lot of recognition to where we are standing now. The NSATEC committee, all the volunteer analyzers, all the authors and co-authors who take the time to report on the incidents, um, Susan and Heather, who are very important people in our committee, and most importantly, all anesthetists who continue to report and take the time to report the incidents to us. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Endlich, for a very interesting talk. Um, Dr. Cook is back. That's wonderful. Thank you. So I am just going to uh, complete my introductory comments. Um, Dr. Cook uh, is also college advisor on All Matters Airway uh, in the UK, and uh, he's lead author or co-author of what must be hundreds of articles on airway management. And speaking for myself, I can say that anything written by Dr. Cook is extremely worthwhile reading. Um, everything is based on science and yet tempered with a very, very good dose of common sense. So Dr. Cook's talk this morning is National Audits, What Data Should We Collect? Dr. Cook. Adam, thanks very much. Um, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, apologies for the errors. Um, all entirely mine. Um, so in the context of law um, and litigation, so. Anesthesia is a low-risk medical legal specialty. 
um, we account for about 4% of uh, medical legal claims in the UK. Um, within that, airway is relatively low risk. It's about 9% in the UK. Um, uh, but they're usually high importance cases with a third of them being deaths and a third of them being brain damage cases. The, the value of the... The value of the NAPs is I think it tells us um, about rare events um, and it's one of the few ways we can really get uh, good information about these. Um, so I'm asked to answer the question about... Forwarding now. It doesn't appear to be forwarding. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'm asked to talk about what data should be collected, I'm and I'm actually not going to answer that question. I think it's quite difficult to answer, uh, but I'm going to talk about the data that we have collected. Uh, these are the acknowledgements, uh, pre predominantly the NAP team, which is really Anesthesia UK. Um, it's not forwarding. Okay, it is making some delay. Um, so these are the National Audit Projects, which I've been involved with for a couple of decades, really, and they look at... Um, uh, important, usually major events, complications of anaesthesia and critical care management, um, and we've focused on various different ones. The most recent one is about uh, perioptic cardiac arrest, and that has um, airway information in it. Um, if you want to get more information on it, either Google NAP7 at RCOA, which will take you to uh, the report and papers published in anaesthesia. He's been a great um, uh, collaborator. Or NAP7 report, and that will take you to the individual chapters. There is something in it for everyone. Um, and this was the airway paper recently published in anesthesia. Um, and before I talk about these, um, what we collected, the, the events, I'm going to just mention these. So this is from two papers, one by Handley, if nothing goes wrong, is everything all right? And one from Newman, if almost nothing goes wrong, is everything all right? And so these are the, if you have a certain number of events in a cohort of N patients, how, how common is the event that you've kind of excluded? And the answer is that if you have no events, in N patients, you, you've not excluded, but the 95 confidence interval includes 3 over N, and then 1, 3, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9. And those are quite useful things to remember when you're reading. So when you say there were no cases of fatality in 1,000 airway cases, um, fatalities in airway cases could still be 1 in 300. If there were three cases of aspiration, you could be talking about an instance of 1 in 1,000. And if we just got a paper of 100 patients, then consider what that means. So our starting point is NAP4, now 15 years old. That set the tail for where airway management was at, certainly in the UK. And since there have been lots of excellent studies performed by a number of people um, looking at... So, so um, the first one was um, Hans Hutink in the Netherlands, who did what he described as, the, as a mini-NAP. And he looked at uh, almost 3,000 patients every day um, and tried to identify airway events. And there have been a number of these detailed analyses since then, looking at about... 2,000, 7,000, 5,000, 1,000 patients. NAP7, we've added another one, this time with 24,000 patients in it. And then these larger, so, so in these cases, it, it, it you, can, you can identify these relatively um, frequent events, but often they're, there's what I call process variables. They're not necessarily that important to the patients, but that does give us detail about our everyday practice and complications. You have to look at regional or national data and Yasmin has been at the fore of some of that, both in a previous paper and then in the work she's doing in WebAirs. Um, and you can look at larger numbers, and you start to get a bigger figure. Um, actually, when you look at the national audits, we've looked at 3 million patients for each of our projects. So these are, these are, these are big data. And you can start to look at the very rare complications. Even then, you can't draw strong conclusions, but you can get some themic analysis. The numerical analysis, I have to say, is rather weak for these events. But I think these are patient-centered, um, and you need to collect considerable data to get value from it. So NAP7 has produced two major airway, international airway studies. So there are two, they're major, and they're international, because there's four countries in the UK. Um, our process is uh, traditionally now what's called a baseline survey, an activity survey, and case reporting. And the activity survey, which comes in the middle, is a survey that goes to all UK hospitals, and we ask for information about all cases for, that, that were performed in the hospital with an anaesthetist for four days. Um, and in this series, we got 26,000 cases. And as part of that, we looked at complications, which included airway complications. So these, this is sort of an intermediate level size um, study, I would say. 
we simply looked at cases within the period of, of uh, anaesthesia care, and these were just intraoperative cases. And we, in terms of the complications we were looking at, they were quite important. It wasn't just a bit of hypoxia. Um, it were, these were cases that potentially would lead to perioperative cardiac arrest, which is why it was in this, in this particular project, and the same for breathing. So these are not trivial complications, but rather important complications. And I would emphasize, um, as Yasmin has, has with her previous study, um, the importance of the denominator. If you want to make comparisons between groups, if you want to make or determine instances or make your prevalences of value, you really need to get an accurate denominator. So with our denominator of, in this case, 2.7 million uh, general anaesthetics estimated in the UK, or 26,000 cases in this small series, um, we found that an instance of a complication that might lead to a, to a might progress to a cardiac arrest in the hands of a medici, medically qualified anaesthetist is one in 18 cases. Um, and the commonest ones were cardiovascular, but if you combine airway and breathing, and the breathing ones really a sort of airway, hypercapnia, hypocapnia, et cetera, um, um, they were 40%. So not at all uncommon. So in contrast to Yasmin's study, where she's looked at rather more, more serious complications, we've got instances about 1% of airway and breathing complications, um, but similar in terms of the, the, the types of events. But if we want to get from even this study of 26,000 cases, the instance of can't intubate, can't oxygenate, or EFONA, we're looking at one in 8,000. But look at the size of the confidence interval. It's almost meaningless. And then we can produce this heat map. So here we've got the instance of different complications um, uh, by area of specialism. And on the left, we've got elective cases, and on the right, we've got emergency. So you can see that most complications increase, so they become darker, they become more red uh, in emergencies. That doesn't actually happen for airway, nor does it happen for breathing. So the instance of the heat map for airway and breathing is rather similar for elective at the top and, and emergencies at the bottom. So you can see, well, that's reassuring. Emergencies are no more dangerous. I actually think it's not reassuring. I think it means that airway and breathing complications can happen during any anaesthetic and ca can catch us out, even though they're infrequent. And then if you look at different groups, you can see they vary very differently. So um, across the board, the risk of, these are, these, the risk of perioperative cardiac arrest, but also the risk of complications, massively increased in neonates and children under the age of, under the age of one. Um, and then very rare, or very much lower in, in young, healthy people, and then rising eventually in the, the older populations. Uh, the second uh, group, the registry of cardiac arrests. So here we need to be required, <coughs> excuse me, for a patient to be entered into the project, they had to have a cardiac arrest that required five chest compressions or defibrillation while under the care of an anaesthetist. And we did include that for 24 hours afterwards, although I suspect we missed most of the post-operative cases. And so here we had 881 cases. So if we go back to those, those intermediate and relatively large studies looking at uh, major complications, the mini naps and the, 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 the intermediate sized naps, they had one death or one cardiac arrest or a couple of admissions to ITU. But here we've got 881 cardiac arrests. So there's a large number of studies. And within that, 12% of our cases, so everybody had their airway managed or most people had their airway managed, um, and 12% uh, or 113 of these cases were airway. And there's a wide variety of events that happened. If we go down into airway and breathing, so breathing accounted for, um, uh, sorry, airway accounted for two thirds of these um, perioptive cardiac arrests compared to breathing. So much more common than breathing. But interestingly enough, the outcomes were much worse in breathing. In fact, they were reversed. So two thirds of the, so the, the outcomes from breathing were more than twice as, as as adverse as airway. And actually, the airway compared to other groups had relatively good outcomes. We're good at managing the airway. The breathing complications didn't. Um, so the overall instance of preoperative cardiac arrest, one in 3,000, about the same as dental damage. We tend to tell most people about the risk of dental damage. I'm not sure that everybody tells everybody about the risk of, 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 of dying during the operation, albeit that 75% of people will be resuscitated. And of airway deaths, about one in 30,000. So these are rare events, impossible to study with randomized controlled trials, only possible to study usefully with registries. And there we can fit um, cardiac arrest, all these other airway complications into what this is the college's, our college's um, document, the one pager that says what are the risks of anesthesia, which every patient should receive before anesthesia. But again, if you take it down into different groups, 
So if you're, a lot of these were in elderly, frail, emergency, late night cases. Um, and if you, if, you, if you go down to um, the, the healthy patient, the elective patient, the ASA 1 and 2 patients, we're talking about, um, about a threefold reduction in cardiac arrest, but still 1 in 11,000 at its lowest. And also the proportion of survivors is higher in, this, in the healthy patients. So you do have to dive down into the detail. And within those cases, we can say, well, look, we've looked at 3 million cases. We can learn lots of things about aspiration, et cetera. But remember, you had to have a cardiac arrest. You had to have aspirate for cardiac arrest. There are small numbers of cases. And I'm not going to read these out in detail. But we have information about the cases of aspiration. And actually, there were very few that related to poor management and superarthritis airways or obese patients, which was the case in NAV4 a different cohort, mainly emergency laparotomies. Um, we had six cases of unrecognized esophageal intubation, two in the, in, the, in the activity survey, four in the registry, not all recognized by the reporters, and all associated with poor interpretation of capnography. It shouldn't be happening in 2022 as it was when this was done. And there's really no progress since NAP4. Emergency front of neck airway, we had 43, I think it was, no, 58 in NAP4 15 years ago. But you didn't have to have a cardiac arrest to have it reported to NAP4. And there were very, very few cases in NAP7. Again, half of them ENT, half of them managed by an anaesthetist. Pretty poor outcome for most of them. Um, we could discuss that separately. And again, coming back to the denominator, we could work out the relative risk of events. So in NAP4, 40% of um, uh, events reported to NAP4 were from uh, head and neck. Um, and that's the often associated with airway obstruction. Again, as people have said, often associated with poor error assessment or poor response to that assessment. In NAP7, that's reduced to 27%. So can we compare NAP4 and NAP7? Well, we can, whether we should. Are we comparing apples and pears? We might be comparing apples with tables. I'm not really sure. Um, you can see there are differences, but there are, there are pitfalls to that. There's the inclusion criteria, there are confounders, and there's the passage of time. Time means that the population practices and personnel have changed. What we do has changed. So the NAP4 inclusion were not you had to have a cardiac arrest, but you had to have an airway complication, and that had to lead to one of the four outcomes, death, brain damage, uh, um, e-phone or admission or to ITU or prolongation. So they're very different uh, studies. Looking at the, because we've, we've done a sort of a state of the nation audit um, uh, across the NAPs for the last 10 years, we compare NAP5's data with NAP7, with NAP we see that the age of the patients anaesthetized in the UK has increased by about three years over that, that time. Now, your all-cause mortality um, increases 10% for every year you age, not actually on your birthday, but over the year it increases by 10%. So that two and a half, 2.3 year increase in, in age um, compounded counts to about 27%. Our patients are 27% more likely to die um, of natural causes um, now than they were 10 years ago. They're a higher risk uh, cohort. Added to that, there's a dramatic increase in obesity. And not only is obesity increased, but the more obese have become more, more obese. So the increases in obesity increase in the, in the, to the greatest extent in the, in the, in the higher, level, higher degrees of obesity, and there's more comorbidity. So we can see that the population, this is from the cohorts in NAP7, um, the, the cohorts um, of the older patients have got really high proportions of comorbidity. So practices have changed as well. So um, the supergotic airway was the prime airway in NAP4. On the right, 56% of patients were anesthetized uh, with a supergotic airway. That's now reduced to 52%. Is it because patients are becoming more obese, or is it because we did it at the tail end of the pandemic when people were erroneously thinking that aerosols were generating the supergotic airways? I don't know. Also, our changes, we've, we've changed dramatically in the UK. We've caught up with Australasia. Um, uh, we're now using 90% second-generation supergotic airways, whereas previously uh, in NAP4, it was, um, uh, sorry, using 65%, uh, whereas previously it was 10%. But this confounder, so this is a map which looks at the, across the bottom, the denominator, the number of cases by surgical specialty in the activity survey, and then the number of cases um, in the, on the y-axis. So we can see that anything down bottom bottom right is low risk. Obstetrics, very low risk for perioperative cardiac arrest. General surgery, lots of cases and a bit higher risk. And then across to the left, we've got cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, and cardiology, which all account for less than 1% of 
all surgical activity, about 10% of cardiac arrests. And then the actual causes of the cardiac arrest vary as well. So only in e ENT is severe hypoxemia the commonest cause of cardiac arrest, whereas if you look at other specialties, they have other variants. I'm just going to skip through those, those slides. Um, so what data you can collect is determined by, or, or, so data varies over time. The data you can and should collect varies according to what, you're, what you need. Um, this is an eFONA database that we've been in the process of setting up. I've said five years, but I think it's probably seven years. And we've been through three stages of trying to determine how we collect the data. And every time we uh, send out the, the data to work out what should be in it, um, the reviewers say there's far too much data. Um, nobody's going to fill this in. It's almost impossible to do. But by the way, could you also add this question and this question and this question? Um, so it's become very difficult. and We're hoping to get that sorted in the next year. Um, and those are the challenges. So the value of pick lists versus narratives. Narratives are difficult to analyze, but useful in getting detail um, and the nitty gritty. Um, gravity versus detail, service evaluation versus research. And the problem in, in low frequency events of actually reverse identifying patients. If you know the date or the age of a patient um, and a rare event, then it's actually possible to identify a patient from that information. Last two slides. So. Um, to add in terms of, so we can collect large national data, data. so the, the, um, the Australian database is different from, from our database, it doesn't necessarily have quite the same denominators uh, process, um, but what it does do is focus on the events when they happen, whereas we try and look at all, all events. But within those, um, Yasmin's made the very good point about the definition of what is um, um, unrecognized as soft intubation, trying to define it better we need a core outcome data set. So there's been a lot of work on core outcome data sets in perioperative medicine, much of it led by Paul Miles, who I see in the audience um, with the um, step comment process, but we don't have core outcome data sets in, in, in airway anesthesia. So we need to define with patients what are the uh, important outcomes that should be in studies, both randomized controlled trials and registries, and what are the definitions of those studies. In the Cochrane Review of Video Laryngoscopy, we couldn't analyze time to intubate. We couldn't analyze hypoxia because the, the, the definitions vary throughout the published studies. So that piece of work is now being done. It'll be done internationally, and it's under the a term, the ATOM group. So what data should we collect? It de depends entirely on the purpose of your project. So if you're doing a small project, you probably need to collect um, a uh, a low, a low, high frequency complications but, and, and a larger study, lesser frequency. But it should be patient-centered, relevant, easy for the, for, the, for the collector to send it, easy to collate and analyze, which usually means categorical data. It has to have sufficient detail to answer the questions you really want to know about. Um, and it be, has to be consistent with standardized data definitions where possible. And a denominator is very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cook. Uh, very interesting talk. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, before you uh, ask your question, please make sure you have a microphone in your hand. There's one coming. First question. <clears throat> I just have a question about video laryngoscopy. Has video laryngoscopy changed any of these events? I know we're talking about supraglottic airways. I didn't see any mention of uh, video laryngoscopy. Um, would you like to direct that question to any particular speaker or anybody? Anybody. anybody else? Thank you. Is it, is it on? Yes. Yeah. Um, I will try to answer so your question, but I'm, I'm not sure if I really have your answer. When, when we looked at the WebS data, which we've started collecting since 2009, we found that the use of video laryngoscopy has increased. So within, from 2009 to 2016, it was about 33% of um, reporters that used video laryngoscopy. And now when we look at the, at the reports, it's about roughly above more than a half yeah, that video laryngoscopy is used. We don't have the nominator data, so I can't tell you if, um, if it has made airway management better based on, on our incident reporting system. Um, but there are enough studies out there that show that first-pass success is better, risk of hypoxia is less. 
I'm not sure if it's showed a difference in MEP7. I mean, I think there's, I think there's robust evidence that video laryngoscopy improves. It, it, there is undoubted proof that video laryngoscopy is more efficacious um, for the patient and for the anaesthetist, um, or the intubator rather, in, in delivering tracheal intubation. Um, it's, it's harder um, in RCTs to determine safety, but there is good evidence that um, uh, video laryngoscopy reduces hypoxia, reduces multiple attempts, uh, reduces esophageal intubation. So in, in across, all, across all the board, video laryngoscopy reduces esophageal intubation about from 3% to 1% in studies. Now, most of those studies will be in elective settings um, uh, and with straightforward patients intubated by experts. Um, but still, there's 3%. Now, this is not unrecognized esophageal intubation, but you don't get unrecognized esophageal intubation unless you've intubated the esophagus. So if you can reduce the instance by three by threefold, then you're probably doing a, a useful thing. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, very good morning. I am uh, Dr. Punijan from, from Malaysia. This regarding the legal, legal suits, you know, is normally uh, in this process of uh, legal suits, the, the, they will call expert witness, you know, to uh, give uh, some uh, 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 expert on this anesthesia field or what, no? So the, 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 the problem is, so this expert witness, you know, actually is the, uh, who choose, who choose this uh, expert witness? Is it, uh, you know, from the society of anesthesia, for example, those who are very senior and very expert in anesthesia, or the a lawyer? You know, will call anyone that you know they feel you know will 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 support the plaintiff rather than the, the defendant. So I need to know actually who uh, responsibility responsibility of this choosing uh, you know expert witness. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah, thanks for that question. I can only answer this with reference to my country, which is Australia. I know that England is fairly similar in this. So at the moment, um, it is up to the legal team representing the person to choose the expert witness and that is why uh, this has come under scrutiny in the last decade or so because there is obviously a conflict if you are paying an expert and the legal team has already predetermined the outcome that they want from the case. Um, there are a lot of high-level discussions going on in Australia and other parts of the world about whether there would be a better system. And one of the systems that has been proposed is um, that specialty colleges are involved in providing impartial experts for uh, deciding um, medico-legal cases. That's not yet happening. One thing that has happened in Australia is... Um, they have introduced conclaves, which means that the experts have to, are brought together um, in the pre-trial phase and they are asked questions by the uh, judge and they have to come up with answers together. So it means that there is less likelihood of one of the experts being way over here and the other expert being way over here, which is obviously makes it really difficult for the non-medical people to interpret what has happened. Um, so, yes, in answer to the question, it's, it's something that's under debate and I don't think we can safely say we don't have an ideal system at the moment and financial compensation complicates it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, three minutes past ten, so our time for questioning is up. Uh, anybody with any other burning questions for the speakers? Please uh, feel free to ask them individually. Thank you very much for your attention.